There are some in this room today who, like Roy Hobbs, have concluded that there are some mistakes that we just never stop paying for. And you have resigned yourself to the garbage detail of life for the duration of your days here on earth because you have believed a lie. Iris's philosophy in this uh, flicker of faith is that we have two lives. The life we learn with and the life we live after that. Now she may be a bit closer to the truth, but I still think that the prophet Joel would probably disagree with both of our movie characters today. He would probably say that we are given a life to learn with and to sometimes suffer with and hurt with so that we can use what we learn to minister to others in the name of Jesus in the new life. God does not waste anything ever. Instead, He reclaims it, recycles it, redeems it for His glory. This is the work of redemption. And that's a big word we're going to look at today. Redemption is a part of salvation, but with some added features. It takes the work of cleansing salvation and it builds upon it. It's a great concept for a church like Crossroads, where so many of us spent considerable time squandering our inheritance only to come to the conclusion that living at home with the Father is better than slopping pigs in the far country, whatever that country may be for us. The Old Testament book of Joel is a gold mine for salvation, repentance, and deliverance and redemption. And I want to encourage you to read the whole book of Joel this week. It's not that long. Everybody in this room could do it. It's not that hard. Now, not much is known about the actual man, Joel. Many Bible scholars believe that he was one of the first of what they call the writing prophets, prophets who wrote their stuff down. And if that is true, then God started a new work with the writing of Joel. It was a work of preparing the human race for the end of time as we know it. And though Joel starts to outline his plan and begins to teach mankind that there will be a coming day of judgment, he also hits on the things that are important as we wait for that day. Joel calls this coming event the day of the Lord. And he uses that term five times in his short little book of Joel. Now, we're not going to focus today on that day of the Lord, but if you dig into Joel, you're going to find some interesting end times prophecy there. And although Joel is grouped with what has become known as the minor prophets, his words are of major importance. Don't forget that. For not only does Joel speak a message about the end time of judgment, he also delivers a message of repentance, salvation, deliverance, redemption, and hope for today. So here's the big thought for today, the big idea. If you don't remember anything from today, remember this. God is able to repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. God is able to repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Now you may be thinking, what? What does that mean? Believe me, before you leave this room today, you're going to understand it. We're going to amplify it loudly in just a little bit. But first, we have to do some preliminary work. We learn from Joel today first that salvation is non-discriminatory. Non-discriminatory. Joel says it this way in Joel 2.32. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Now listen to me. This was a bold statement for a Jewish prophet to make. It could have gotten him stoned to death. He claimed that salvation was not limited to a select race, a select nation, a select people. He proclaimed that it is available to anyone, even those who were not Jewish. In other words, God does not discriminate. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. John the Apostle in the New Testament put it this way in John chapter 1. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Being saved, being born of God, is available to everyone who will believe Him and receive Him. And that includes everybody in this room today. No matter what you have done, no matter who you have been, who you are, all who believe in His name can be saved and become a child of God. All. A-L-L. All. Now the Apostle Peter in one of his letters, put it this way. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord will call. All. All. Everyone. And then some years later, Paul, the apostle, wrote down this same truth of God, and he sent it in a letter to the church in Rome. And in Romans 10, 11, he says, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Anyone, all, everyone. Salvation is non-discriminatory, and that means it is is non-discriminatory in this room here today. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, whatever you have done, Jesus died for you, and you can become a child of God and an heir of salvation. You can be forgiven. You can be saved today. Non-discriminatory. No discrimination. Now, the second thing we can learn from Joel in his great book is that salvation is a choice. It's a choice that we make. Because in Joel 2.32, he says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. This is important because while salvation is completely non-discriminatory, it is not universal. Let me say that again. While salvation is completely non-discriminatory, it is not universal. And regardless of what many modern heretics teach today, not everyone on this earth will be saved. And that's because salvation is a choice. We must call upon the name of the Lord. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that calling upon the Lord must be done while we are still breathing air on this earth. And there's no fool in God. He knows. He's sovereign. He's omniscient. And when our heart stops and we return to dust, it will be too late. And Joel teaches this clearly in his book. Jesus also taught this truth in one of the favorite verses of all time, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever believes, everyone who calls, salvation is a choice that we make. Now, Jesus said in Mark 8, verse 34, then He called the crowd to Him along with the disciples and said, if anyone would come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. If anyone would come after me. Salvation is a choice. Now, if, <laughs> that's even a smaller word than our word from last week, unless, 
but it is just as powerful. Jesus used this little two-letter word that has gigantic significance. Don't ever skip over it. If you come after me, he said. And he repeats it in Matthew 19, verse 21 through 22. He says, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. The word if looms large in the words of Christ. Salvation is a choice we make. In fact, this young man that Jesus spoke to here was a good man. But in Matthew 19, it shares that he did not accept Christ. It says he went away sad because he didn't want to do what Jesus said he needed to do. And Jesus did not pursue him or plead with him to come back or try to persuade them. He gave them a simple choice. Salvation is non-discriminatory, but it is not universal. Salvation is a choice, and we have that choice today, right here. The third thing that Joel speaks to here in his book is that salvation makes a difference. It makes a difference. It changes us. Joel 2.32 Here's what he says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. You know what that means? It means here's where we begin to get into this fruit of salvation. God teaches throughout scripture that salvation should make a difference. Following him makes a difference. Salvation should bring changes in our life or it's probably not biblical salvation. Joel echoes this theme and he says that because of repentance and because of salvation in Jerusalem, there'll be deliverance. Now being saved infers that we are saved from something. You get that, right? We are delivered from bondage and death. Now if, if a drowning man cried out for help, and you rescued them from the water. But then that man jumped right back into the water after being saved. Wouldn't we have doubts as to whether or not he truly wanted to be rescued or delivered? Many people today want to be rescued from death. But they don't want to stop hanging around with death. They want to continue to love on those things that are killing them. They don't want to give up their death-producing behaviors. In other words, they want God's blessing. They want His protection. But they don't really want God's deliverance and direction. Listen up. God wants to do more than just save you. Salvation of souls is so important. But God also wants to deliver you here on this earth. And that implies movement from one place to another. <laughs> Our mail is delivered to us from another place. Pizza is delivered to our door from somewhere else. And deliverance involves God moving us or removing us from one place and moving us to another. From one circumstance to another from bondage to freedom, from drunkenness to sobriety, from shame to guilt, from death to life. And that is why Scripture teaches in Titus 2, verse 11 through 14, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. There's our universal thing. And it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, listen to this, to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for Himself a people that are His very own, eager to do what is good. There's that word redeem. So it's not a matter of 
paying for our mistakes for the rest of our lives. It's a matter of learning from those mistakes and ceasing those toxic behaviors that drag us down. It's a matter of redeeming our mistakes and turning them into words of wisdom spoken at the proper time. Salvation should make a difference. And if it doesn't make a difference, then it is likely not biblical salvation. And to ensure that salvation makes a difference and to assist us in our deliverance, God does another miracle in our life and He redeems our past for His present and future glory. That's number four today. Salvation brings the redemption of our life. God has a purpose for saving us and delivering us on this side of eternity. He wants to take back our wasted years and He wants to use our life as a witness to His power and His goodness. Here's how God puts it in the book of Joel, Joel 2.25. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts and other locusts in the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You hear that? God sent the locusts. And locusts were seen most of the time as a curse from God. This goes clear back to the ten plagues that God sent onto Egypt to force the Pharaoh to let his people go. One of those plagues was a plague of locusts. They devoured the crops and virtually everything in their sight. They bit people and they contaminated everything. Boy, I still remember watching a grasshopper plague back in the mid-1950s wipe out a corn crop of my father's. They were so thick that you couldn't walk in that field of 150 acres without stepping on a grasshopper. The whole field was like that. They were everywhere and they wiped out hundreds of acres of crops. And in biblical times, locusts were seen by many as a punishment from God. But what they really represented was the fruit of disobedience. (laughs) The fruit of disobedience. In other words, the locusts were merely the consequences for the people's refusal to acknowledge and live as if God were the Lord of their lives. And so today, the locusts in our lives are not so much punishment as they are often just the natural consequences of our disobedience. Like those sins. That's why the sign on my office wall says, stupid should hurt. Regardless of whether we view the locusts here as an actual plague of insects, which did sometimes happen, or as the swarming armies of Babylon, which later descended upon Israel and carried them into captivity, says they look like locusts, there were so many of them. And the important part, though, is that God promises that He will repay them for those years the locusts eat after they're done eating. Today, locusts are a metaphor for the sins that devour our lives or have devoured them. And God still says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. God does not say, I will erase the consequences of your sin. He does not say, I'll stop every storm that comes to your place, your life. He says, I will repay you in some way. What he's saying is that he can redeem the years that we've wasted and frittered away. The years that we spent in sin and bondage to whatever. He can make something useful out of the time that we thought we could never possibly use for anything once we saw how bad it was. He can redeem those years and He can use them for His glory in the time we have left. He can use 
any negative experience, He can use our battle scars in a positive way. And He can take our mess and He can turn it into a message. Roy Hobbs was wrong. We don't have to pay for our mistakes for the rest of our lives. We can learn from them. And God can actually use them for His glory if we will turn our lives over to Him and give Him those mistakes too. God says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. And then what God said to Job who we know lost everything in Job 42.12 can be said of us. Job lost everything and yet Scripture says the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. That's looking pretty good to some of us right now, isn't it? I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. I remember what a difference this truth made in my life years ago when a young man half my age pointed me to this verse. I remember the room we were sitting in out at the Methodist Church in Ellsworth, Kansas. I was 35. I was just getting started in the faith and in the church. I mean, we were at what they called a lay witness mission. I was just there to share my testimony. And he was 17, and he had been a strong Christian for years already. He was light years ahead of me in the faith. And we were in a group setting, and I was feeling sorry for myself. Lamenting my wasted years, envying him for his zeal and youth. And this young man spoke up and he said, Lally, I know a verse about that. He said, God will redeem those years. He can use them for good, for His glory. Joel 2.25, God will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. And it was as if a light came on. That night, God impressed Joel 2.25 onto my heart and He taught me that with Him, Nothing is wasted. God would repay me for the years I had squandered drinking and rocking and doing all the other stupid stuff. God would use that experience to help others. And God has kept His Word. And so here we are today. An old alcoholic and rock and roller working for God in the rock and roll rehab church of Salina playing guitar for Jesus instead of for the devil. An old drunk being allowed to minister to so many of those who have been and still are addicted. Those whose hurts, habits, and hang-ups have consumed so much of their lives. And it's been a trip. But I can tell you with authority and certainty, He will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. I know because it happened to me, and it has happened to many of you. You could testify to it. A life that was once food for the locusts has been transformed into bread of life. What once was chained in the darkness has become a light for lost people. And when the Lord, through that young man, spoke Joel 2.25 into my life, He spoke hope into my life. And that's what I want to do here today. God will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. God wants to redeem your life. No matter what you have made of it so far, no matter what you have been through, He wants to bless the latter part of your life more than the first. And he wants to be able to say along with Joseph, the son of Jacob, in Genesis 50-20, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That's redemption. 
God took 20 years out of Joseph's life in captivity and he turned that into salvation for his starving family. The same brothers who had sold him into bondage became the recipients of God's grace and mercy through Joseph who understood what redemption is about. What once may have been considered a worthless life became a life of great worth to those around him. You know how you take those paper coupons that you cut out of the paper or out of those slick things they send you that you want to throw in the trash. You know how you take those? You take them to the store, you cut it out, and they are actually turned into something of cash value. What do you call it when you do that with a coupon? You call it redeeming the coupon. And that virtually worthless piece of paper becomes something of value when it is redeemed. It's worth nothing on your kitchen table. But once you redeem it, it becomes valuable. And that's what God has in mind for your life and mine. He wants to redeem our lives to turn something worth very little into something of great value. The Apostle Peter said it this way, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, handed down to you by your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. God wants to take our empty way of life and transform it into a full and meaningful life. And He wants to take that hurt, that pain, that anger, that bitterness, that habit, that hang-up, and He wants to turn it into something that can glorify Him and help others. God wants more than just salvation and deliverance for you and me. He wants to repay us for the years the locusts have eaten. He wants to redeem our lives and change the meaning and value of our past. Could you get into that? I certainly can. Grab a hold of His salvation. Pray for His deliverance today. But also look forward to His redemption. There's great hope to be found in these principles and promises. Psalm 130 verse 7 encourages us. Put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love. And with Him is full redemption. We do not have to pay for our mistakes for the rest of our lives when we give those lives to Jesus. Oh, we will indeed reap some fruit of our sin in years to come. It keeps coming, but that fruit can actually become a spiritual asset when we surrender it to God and use it for His glory. And when it comes to payment, God will not repay us in part. This verse says He will repay us in full. With Him is full redemption. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Saved, delivered, redeemed for His service. A three-point plan from God. And Joel saw that coming for you 2,500 years ago. Awesome. Thank you, Joel. And thank you, God, for loving us enough to save, deliver, and redeem us. And so I ask you, is this what you need in your life? <laughs> it's not an accident that you are here today. It all starts with being saved. Would you like God to change the meaning of the mistakes that you have made as He redeems you? Would you like to be repaid for what it seems like wasted years? Let God redeem your past. Only God could perform a miracle like that. Only God. So I suggest, I, I plead, come to Him today 
and stop messing around on the outskirts because that's not where the healing and the redemption and the deliverance is. It's in the heart of God. Come to Him. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, I want to thank You so much today that You have saved us, delivered us, and redeemed us. And Lord, that process of redemption is so cool to watch. Thank You for giving that to us. And I want to ask that You will will save, deliver, and redeem lives in this room today. No one but that person standing in that spot knows what you're talking about to them, but you're speaking to them right now. You're saying, this is what you need. And so I pray, Lord, that you'll impress their heart and that that impression in their heart will move clear down to their feet and they'll make that trip. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need to be saved today, if you need to be delivered or redeemed, I'm going to ask you to step out and just come and stand here in the front and we're going to pray for you. That's all we'll do. God bless you, my man. Anyone else? God wants to redeem your life.